If I say slavery, what image comes to your mind? If you live in the Western world, then even if I had presented a blank screen here, your mind's eye would probably have conjured up an image very much like this one. And with it, a whole basket of attitudes, opinions and prejudgments that linger. Am I right? But today, I'm going to ask you to think differently. Can you do that? Because in this video, I want to illustrate that slavery is not black and white. Neither is it black and white. So let's reset for a moment. <laughs> Racial hatred doesn't make sense. There seems to be a group who hate Jewish people and black people. Why both? It's like saying, I don't like raspberries, so naturally, I don't eat shellfish or lamb either. I say that because I hate raspberries and shellfish and lamb. But I don't imagine for a minute that I'm part of a large subset of a Venn diagram. I mean, the Jewish people are probably with me on the shellfish, but probably not the raspberries. Are raspberries kosher? As a tour guide, I once had a Jewish family on tour. Now, the only reason that I knew that they were Jewish was that I'd bought them some Tunnock's tea cakes and they refused them. Apparently, raspberries, shellfish, pork, and Tunnock's tea cakes. I asked lots of questions that I'm sure were way more intrusive than appropriate. One of which was, why? What's with the hate and Jewish people thing? I just don't get it. Not only that, it seems to have been a recurring theme for a long time. Hating Jewish folk just didn't make sense to me. Until they refused the Turnix tea cakes, obviously. I explained that I understood the racism that a diminishing number of white folks have towards black folks, even in the 21st century. You see, there was a time when it was essential for some white folks to see black people as less than human in order to justify transatlantic slavery. People had to learn racism because financial gain depended on it. So the idea was promulgated until it became ingrained in society. It's why we in the Western world are used to thinking about slavery in the context of race. I don't see the same logic for the Jews. One of the ladies said, ah, but Jews were the original slaves. No, they weren't. It wasn't like Ramesses came to his advisors one day and said, I was walking in the park and I saw these folk. Jews, I think they were called. And it gave me an idea. And I've invented a thing called slavery. And the good news is, it gets our pyramids built faster as well. Slaves already existed. I didn't question her whether Jews had ever owned slaves. I brought you to Curus before to tell you how it was used in Outlander and to tell you the tale of Thomas Cochrane Seawolf. Today, I brought you here to talk about slavery. So if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you the story. So George Bruce built Cura's Palace behind me at the turn of the 17th century. His big success was coal mining, and what often went with it, salt pans. Coal was becoming an ever more vital part of the economy. Coal workers were a unique breed. They often worked in families. The husband would go down the mine and hew the coal. His wife would carry the coal to the surface. The kids would probably be involved as well. Spending all that day down a mine as a family brought the social limitations of a solitary career and the stigma of the career choice itself. Was it a choice? You weren't forced into it. But you didn't get kids saying, Dad, when I grow up, I want to dig coal. That's a good career choice, son, because I'm pretty certain you'll achieve your goal. But owners of a coal mine they had problems as well. If workers left your mind to go and work for another,
1597 poor laws in Scotland said that somebody who'd been sentenced as a vagrant could be given in servitude to anyone who would keep him in employment and he and his children could be kept in lifelong bondage. Well, vagrants, yes, serves them right for not having proper jobs, eh? Ten years later, in 1606, the Anant Colliers and Salters Act passed into law. It said that if you had a job as a coal miner or worked in the salt pans, you couldn't leave your employer without a written testimonial. You were bound to him for life. Abandoning your role or taking up other employment without permission was a criminal offence of theft from your employer and you could be hunted down and if captured within a year and one day, could get a flogging. If you were a coal miner, things had just changed. Before 1606, you were notionally free, with all the real life restrictions of being born a poor collier compared to being born a coal owner. But now that notional freedom was gone. And things got worse. Because as courts applied the law, a year and a day seemed to get longer. In the case of Wallace of Craigie and William Cunningham of Brown Hill, co-workers who had left Craigie's mine eight years before were forcibly returned to their owner. The ratchet had clicked another notch. A new law in 1641 extended servitude to not just colliers themselves, but to surface workers and ancillary roles. The legislation also extended to workers in manufacturing, although that wasn't strictly enforced. This law also banned coal miners from customary holidays other than one day at Christmas, and it demanded a six-day week. What about the collier children? The School Establishment Act 1616 required publicly funded, church-supervised schools to be established in every parish in Scotland. But not for the children of coal miners. Slavery would be hereditary. Often, a coal owner would pay a fee to bring somebody into bondage as a coal worker. It might be the gift of a pair of shoes. It might be more. But now, it was limited to 20 mercs. Now, coal owners would use this custom to give an existing coal worker's newborn a baptism gift. So even as the minister gave the child to God for eternity, the coal owners were saying, in life, that child belongs to me. The dad was responsible for paying costs of recovery if one of their children ran away. Another act in 1672 gave coal masters the right of apprehending vagabonds and their children without the need of a trial in a court of law. Coal workers were included in the inventory of sale and land or property. In Fife, a collier wasn't even allowed to be buried in the same grounds as a free man. Now I've called them slaves. It was a term often used at the time, and in general and in legal documents. But you might reasonably say that as the ratchet tightened, on men who had started off nominally free, the Caribbean and the Americas were full of black men and women in far worse conditions, and you'd be right. Colliers were paid a wage, sometimes as much as three times that of a general labourer. They could own property, they could pass that property on to their children, they could even stand for the borough council. But they couldn't leave their master or choose a different life for themselves or their family. They weren't chattel slaves transported across an ocean, subjected to horrific conditions, punishment, torture or murder. But the conditions weren't great. But their women weren't systematically raped by the mine owners. People often comment about ancestors who crossed the Atlantic having been sold into or having sold themselves in indentured servitude. And that's not the same thing either. But slavery isn't black and white. It's not digital, it's analogue. At one end, you're notionally free, but have freedoms restricted by employers or others. You might even have to get vaccinated for the greater good. At the very other extreme is life under the lash in cotton fields or a sugar plantation.
each click of the ratchet turns the screw a little bit higher until this is the image of Scottish mining that I grew up with. Hard-working, noble men, not children, who put in a day shift at the pit head and lived as members of a free society. So how did the change happen? I've brought you to Scotland's National Mining Museum at Newton Grange, which is worth a visit when you can, incidentally. And I've brought you here to take you back to the 1770s and another look at that freeman-slave continuum. In 1769, John Wedderburn came home to Perthshire having made a bucket load of cash as a plantation owner in Jamaica. Seven years earlier, he'd bought a young slave boy from a ship's captain newly arrived from the Guinea coast. Wedderburn brought the slave Joseph Knight back with him to serve in his home in Perthshire where he was baptised. But when young Joseph got jiggy with Anne Thompson, one of the other servants, Wedderburn refused to let him live with his now wife and child. When Knight left anyway, his master had him arrested. Now, Knight knew that a couple of years earlier another slave had landed in England, claimed his freedom and it had been judged that slavery was unsupported by common law in England. Joseph Knight too won his case in Perthshire, but his master appealed and the case went all the way through the various stages of the Scottish court up to the court of session in Edinburgh. And the court decided that slavery and its state is not recognised in the laws of this kingdom and is inconsistent with the principles thereof. The slave owner's appeal was thrown out by the court of session because we sit here to enforce right, not to enforce wrong. Although in the plantations they have laid hold of the poor blacks and made slaves of them, yet I do not think that it is agreeable to humanity, not to say to the Christian religion. Is a man a slave because he is black? No, he is our brother and he is a man. He is in this land of liberty with his wife and child. Let him remain there. The court thus held that the dominion assumed over this Negro under the law of Jamaica being unjust could not be supported in this country to any extent. Unless he was thinking of working down the pit. The court also held that Joseph Knight was protected from being unjustly arrested for leaving his master under the habeas corpus rights conferred by the Act of 1701. Rights which the Act specifically denied to coal miners. It was while all this was going on that an Emancipation Act for coal miners passed through the Scottish Parliament, so that anyone becoming a coal miner was no longer bound to servitude. But if you were already a coal miner, then depending on your age, you had to wait three to ten years before you were entitled to freedom. These terms could be extended if no replacement was found for you. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't just given to you. You'd have to have the time and wherewithal to take the matter to court. So years after the slave Joseph Knight was freed, many coal miners were not. Plus, the emancipation of miners didn't come because of an outcry for Christian values. It came because coal owners needed to find a way to persuade people to go and work in their mines. As it turns out, higher wages in exchange for serfdom and slavery somehow hadn't worked. The final Parliamentary Act liberating coal miners came in 1799. But let me make three quick points. One, slavery isn't digital. Coal miners were moved little by little up that increasing slope of slavery as their rights were eroded by each succeeding Act of Parliament. And there's maybe a lesson in that for us all. Two, men like Joseph Knight may have been higher up that slope, but slavery isn't black and white. If anything, the true colour of slavery is green. And one last point, by the time this was in full swing as a modern working colliery, coal slavery was gone. 
And I don't remember anybody looking down on people because they were coal miners. So if 250 years after Night v. Weatherburn, you do still look down on people because of their colour, maybe it's time to join the 21st century. I've got a video about slavery in the Scottish church coming up on screen now. In the meantime, I mean, Dawkins can be Lama Alive. Cheerio and Drastic.